How do you do? Welcome to the lively art of conversation on Cups Show, the talk of television. I'm Irv Cups, and it's your host. And among the lively ones talking today will be Godfrey Cambridge, the entertainer and actor, Sonny and Cher, the delightful husband and wife singing team, Werner Klemperer, Colonel Klink of Hogan's Heroes, Ira Levin, who wrote the bestseller Rosemary's Baby and now has a new book called This Perfect Day, and Felice Gordon, a former theatrical agent who's turned author. Her book is called The Pleasure Principle. Welcome, one and all. Thank you. Sonny and Cher, it's so nice to see you, folks. It's been a long time since we've had a chance to chat and visit with you. Tell me, have Sonny and Cher changed their image? You were among the first to rebel against the clothes you wore, the way out clothing at one time. Now you're more establishment, I would say, in your dress on stage. Your music has changed a little bit away from rock and roll. Probably. Externally, you would say yes. There's a there's a positive change. Internally, probably no, none whatsoever. I think the whole point, like we were talking before backstage, was to try and uh, bring everybody back together. There seems to be like a, a a positive separation of 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 old and young. That's all. You know, when you work, you either work for the old or you work for the young. And, and hopefully, if we're successful, I would like to just forget how old somebody is in an audience uh have them forget uh that my hair is long and now i can work in a tuxedo if i want to so i i think i think the clothes were required then i think uh you needed that at that time uh you don't now now you can go with what's inside you i th and now i think if you just put the clothes on as a uniform that uh, you're you're watering it down and it doesn't belong anymore so so from that respect we've discarded that exterior kind of a thing and hopefully people can get inside of us now you know but when when we were start when we started there were no hippies there were no uh Beatles there were there wasn't anything and to to break through with not not so much a nonconformity but individuality or, or freshness or something because everything was formatted at that time. Well, you were the first to go that way. Now perhaps you're setting a trend uh, coming back the other way. If I set any trend now, I would like to set no trend and say that everybody can entertain and, and, and uh, you don't have to be a specific type of entertainer. You shouldn't... I don't think an entertainer should... should gear his show for a certain age bracket. I think we, you should just eliminate age. You should entertain, period. Young, old, whatever. Well, you know? Frank Sinatra achieved that, didn't he? He, he appeals to the young and old. And he I think any good like... entertainer does, really. Yes, I don't I think... think so. uh, but he'll never be much. He'll never, <laughs> <laughs> he'll never make it, but other than that. <laughs> <laughs> On a more serious note, Sonny, the last time we really had a chat was at the 1948 Democratic Convention. And I right. bring it up because what's happening in the world today is really relevant to what you said way back there at the convention in 1968. You made a speech on behalf of the young people being involved in the political process, and you pleaded with the Democrats to do something about this. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anything came about it, uh, but certainly you were echoing the, what is being said, or you were saying what is being echoed today around the campuses. I, I got a plank in the platform that in the Democratic platform, it did finally go through where they were going to institute a youth commission, which would, which would kind of make the, the young people feel involved. And I was hoping that it would eliminate the frustration that, that, that exists between the two factions. And it went in and it, it got through. And I think the, 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 the thing that disturbed me the most is after it went in, and I had it in black and white. Then I went down to the park and said, here it is. See, you can do it through the system. Just just go that way. And that was rejected from, from, from the, the other end, too. And I was totally confused after, after that point. And I said, the best thing I can do is just do what I do well and hope somebody will, yeah. will, will go from there, you know? These are really disturbing times. I presume you are deeply concerned as everybody else. Your book certainly gives us an answer. We'll have a whole computerized society. We won't have to worry about making decisions. Well, I think we'll have other things to worry about, though. I think when we uh, have to stop worrying about our own decisions, then, then it's a question of who's, who's making the decisions for us. And uh, I, th I think the, the big danger today is looking for some kind of 
answer that's going to take the whole load off our shoulders because I think you know life has always had its problems and we, we've got to accept the fact that problems are part of life and, and not hope for any uh, freedom from them because uh, you know what's so interesting uh, I just want to throw my word in here because I'm terribly disturbed too about the last few weeks uh, you know what seems to be so difficult is that uh, we, and I talk about myself being a little older than the younger people, we seem to have a great deal of problem, problems being able to say we might be wrong in some of our thinking. We have a reluctance to say that. That's well, everybody, everybody has. Everybody. Has. Nobody will admit he's wrong until he's proved and wrong, really. And uh, That's so difficult yeah, like because I if think, we could uh, just, you know, it just takes so little. To, you know, and yes, the, and that seems like such a hard thing for somebody to say. Very big mountain I'm, to climb. I over. might be wrong, but it's like somebody lifts a weight. Because I think that's all the young people really. They would they kind of like to hear right. that the possibility yeah. exists that they have something to say. Nothing else. But I, I don't think they'll ever believe it until they've proved it. Really. Well, it's, you know, it's kind of magic. Every idea sort of makes its its own way and ha has to win its way. And, you know, I think the young people are winning today. I don't think there's any doubt about it. Yeah, well, I tell you, and, I but, have a but it can't be easy. You know, I, I think if the administration turned around and said, okay, we're going to do everything you ask, there would still be this pressure to, to express something. But you see, the administration is terribly reluctant. If I were to put well, myself to as the administration, I have a 10-year-old son, and this happened very recently, it was devastating to me because I was certainly at fault. There was a situation in, uh, in which he did something that I had to explain to him, and I was totally reluctant to really sort of come yeah. towards him, and I was being very abrupt and, you know, sort of single-minded my own way, and he looked at me, and he was ten, he's 10 years old, and he says, look, that just isn't good enough for me. You know, and that's really what it's all about. It isn't good enough. Anymore. I think because there's been such a great difficulty in solving the problems that what has happened is we have many older people who actually hate the young. They hate the young because the young ask them for change and ask them for answers or to work on answers. And they really get to hate. I remember sitting at home uh, in California once I had a house there. And I sat there and it was a late night show and the man who shall remain nameless was sitting on the show, on the panel show, and the hatred that he had for this young man who had long hair, but was a Harvard lawyer, graduate, and who represented a lot of rock groups, you know, who got busted or in trouble or what have you, and the hatred, I, I almost felt uncomfortable to watch his close-ups. They would cut away while this kid was talking, to watch his close-ups on that show, I, I just, it was, it was painful for me to watch, to see that complete blind hatred, you know. And then the news went off, and I found out that a member of his family had committed suicide. And I, and I said, isn't it a pity? Maybe if there wasn't so much hatred of that young, maybe they might have talked. And I wasn't related or anything, but just the vibrations I got. I think there is a hatred of the young because they ask questions. They say, you've done it your way and it's wrong, babe. It's not working. And that hatred comes because of reluctance to change and the reluctance to even look for the answers. I wonder if it's just hatred or if it isn't a little bit of hatred of yourself because you've had the problem of not being able to cope, not being willing to cope. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, the, the, the establishment right. would like to keep on living a kind of a lie and a kind of a really, truly phony existence. You know, you know, well, I think this is true of every older generation. They'd sort of like to keep things going, and it's always the younger who have to exert a pressure, and then the younger generation becomes an older generation. They'll turn right around yes. and take the same attitude. But in all the revolutions that's what's happening we've, to us. Yes, but in all the revolutions we've had through the history, I think, basically, it has been mostly political, it has been economical, it has been industrial. Or today, it's very emotional. I mean, it's very, it has much to do with your whole inner being. I think being, that's you know, probably that's always been true. Well, yeah. don't, you, don't you think that, you know, people who were involved in an in industrial revolution mm -hmm. 75 years ago had their emotions involved in it, too? Yes, it's I all emotion. So. Yeah, when when you're dealing in, in emotions, it's difficult to, to get, become very logical. And right now, we're in a... a such an emotional state that nobody is really very logical at all. I think logic is, is get, getting more and more discarded. But I, uh, I can't now 
dump everything on the old people. You know, uh, I, I have to say the same hypocrisy and bigotry exists with the other faction as oh, much as the sure, other faction. Yeah, I mean, sure. I'll see a guy who, in a naive way, will try to dress contemporarily, and, and 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 the kids will kind of scoff at him because he doesn't know how and they don't say yeah. this is how you do it but you're trying you know uh so there's there's there both factions are still definitely they just have a chip on their shoulder and and nobody nobody seems to want to get out of an emotional state and get into an uh, illogical state there's right a kind now. of intolerance that i found even in colleges where when you say a line before you finish the line, say if the line has FBI in it or ROTC, before you finish the line, you hear cheers and right, boos right, and exactly. hisses. Yeah. And I said, emotion. folks, since we're going to work that way, let me finish the line right. and then we'll vote on it. <laughs> yeah, you right. know? Uh -huh. And uh, a simple majority will take it. You know? and because you say, wait a minute, dummy, let find out whether I'm pro, con, or what the line is all about. You know, but there's that, ah, to the battlements, you know. And uh, it becomes rather discouraging. Exactly. But also, I mean, when, when kids Go ahead, son. do Chair. stuff like that, they're not kids anymore. I mean, what, if, if someone can cause uh, destruction of a bank like they did in, in, uh, San, in Santa Barbara, and uh, when they can tear down a whole, a whole uh, town like in Kent, you can hide under the guise of being a kid. Uh or you can stand up because you're not a kid anymore when you can destroy a whole place. When you're in college, I don't think you're a kid anymore. You're well, screaming for equal rights no on one hand and then wanting to there's hide no behind being a kid. There's no question that there is a fringe number that are dedicated to violence, and they do have there's a great effect if, on the campus. There's campers. some if it were settled today. Fortunately, they, they are a small group. There's, there's and you must recognize the fact that the great but majority of the students who are protesting are not violent. Right. But they are dedicating to legitimate protest. But well, then, the then the question is, how do you combat violence without being violent? That's really what it comes to. How do you do that? That's very difficult. Well, you've got to use force against right, violence. Right now, we're in a... We're, we're not in, shooting. No, we're not killing. It's going to happen, though. We are going into a confrontation. We have to. That's, I mean, the direction is, is, is inevitable. With, with violence, you're going to get violence. When you talk about uh, uh, television news, there were two pictures that made are indelibly in Scots in my mind for the last year or two I guess it was. One was uh, in Vietnam, uh, I think it was showing Tet, when General Van Loan, uh, one of the people we support, we all support the best people, uh, <laughs> executed uh, a Viet Cong uh, by putting a pistol to his head and shooting him. You mean and that then, famous shot? That yeah, and then they went to a commercial. Okay. That yeah. is indelible That's to right. me. The other one was in Chicago. Uh, I was in New York, and uh, I saw, it was the last shot of the evening, and I saw a white, middle-class, suburban lady in a Chevy automobile who was trying to pick up some kids. And I saw the guards with them saying, go ahead, move, lady, move, lady. And they were going to stab her ties with bayonets. And they said, go ahead, move. And they were going to put an M79 grenade launcher. They had it right in her window, right in her window. You know how big that thing looks. She said, go ahead, move, lady. And then they just said, I said, good night. But they had no ammunition in those. Well, but you look at that, and yeah, you know that's that lady, frightening enough. That lady isn't around an M79. Yeah. Plus, the kids started saying, "Lady, you're being gassed." You know, I just looked at that, and I thought, "Uh huh." And they tell me I'm crazy to keep my passport handy. Uh, <laughs> I found that one thing though. That's a good know, idea. I'm people, people might misinterpret when I say keep my passport handy. Uh, I just got back from a 12,000 mile trip because I do that. I just got to clear my head and I disappear. And uh, I found out there's no hiding place. No. no matter where you go. Yeah, of course. Right. I went to Sweden, you know, where I'm uh, supposedly better than white, you know, because it's like, oh, black, oh, wonderful. <laughs> but they have their own little problems because, you know, I'm sitting there in the plane and a uh, guy says to me, hey, you like here, I have been to Alibama. I said, well, that's nice, beautiful. <laughs> I haven't, but good for you, you know. And he says, <laughs> you know, he says but uh, you will like Sweden. It is nice country here. He said, of course, we have the laps. <laughs> I said, what about the lab? She said, well, they don't work, they're shiftless, and uh, they uh, run around quite a bit, you know. And I said, you got the laps, right. And then he said, of course, we have a gypsy problem here. You know? <laughs> you know? And you just sit there and you say, 
Oh, yeah. I, I just think you miles north of Stockholm and they're talking about the laps and the ditches. There ain't nothing up there but snow. And I stood out, man, facing, you know. So, like, you go to Italy, it's the gypsies, or it's the, it's the Sicilians, you know. It's, it's nothing new that we're all prejudiced people, yeah. and I include right. everybody at this table because mm-hmm. it happens to be a human failing, and it, that, that's the way it is. But uh, right now, I think the whole world is looking at the United States, and again, we, we are failing. I really we've always mean said that. that we, we, are, perfect, we, we, have we have to do better than this. That's all I'm right. saying. I'm not saying it's You're all absolutely. terrible, but I just said we must right. do better. We always and I... said that we had the solutions or we were the good guys. And all of a sudden it comes out we're not the good guys. We have CIA people who drop in and work for Air America. And, well, we, uh, we have a lot yeah. less violence in England because the, the police do not carry guns. They're Nobody thinking of carries getting them, guns. though. I read about that. Yeah, okay. but the police carry guns. They're issued guns on special missions. Only on special missions. Yeah, but they're thinking they of getting them. Now they're handy. using guns more and more. Yeah, yeah. I think they're going to gonna carry them in the next yes. year. Yeah. If, if these things which I think are human progress. failings, yes. Yes. Progress, which I agree with, Yes. I mean, why should it be incumbent upon us to be superhuman, really? Why can't we accept... I'm afraid that we have for a long, well, for a long time America has put itself in that position on every political, on very, every political and, and international issue. Now, if we've done that, we, if we have that kind of pretense, if you are terribly pretentious, then you have to come through, you have to put up or shut up, otherwise don't have any pretense, you see? That's the problem. That's, that's I wonder, Cher and Sonny, if the music that the young people are singing today contributes to the unrest on the campus. Definitely. The... I think so. Definitely. I mean... I think especially today, because when we started out, not saying that it was a, a better time, but I, I think it was because we weren't singing anything for the society or the establishment, but we weren't singing anything against it. We were just saying, let us do what we want to do. Now everything is against everything. A right. song has to be written against something. Yeah. It was not for the joy of just singing a song. And yeah. with the innuendo or the out and out uh, blue material. It, it's, 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 uh, it was a great influence on drugs. Music was a great, great influence on drugs. And what people don't realize is that we controlled 24 hours of the radio. Now, any, uh, any country would consider that a powerful uh, propaganda uh, what element. Uh, weapon. Yes, yeah, it weapon. Was, it was a natural now, element. Now, we had 24 hours a day on almost every major station to say whatever we want, and we were saying it, and then it lost us and got into the hands of the next uh, ones to come, come by. And, and I think it could have been helped. I mean... The people like we went out for drugs, which hurt us with the young. With we the went young out people. against I mean, drugs. You were against, against the use right. of marijuana. But I mean, so we forth. went out and, and said something against drugs. At that time, it was now, detrimental to the Beatles to your came career. out and said something for drugs, at which skyrocketed the sale Lucy of drugs. The sky with and uh, when you're against drugs, it really puts you into the establishment. Yeah. Right, right away. Yeah. You know, the use of music is so important. A lot of people put it down, but the influence it has on the kids today is tremendous, and it ties the young people around the world together because no. these music, these songs are being played all over the world. Nobody understands how powerful yeah. that is. Well, I saw, Let me I ask you a question Woodstock. because you're totally involved. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I just want to say yeah. I saw Woodstock, and that proves that what power it has. Is it half a million kids together? It has been incredible. Not yet. Half a million young people. Is it not true that the new music, which I happen to be crazy about because it means something, is it not true that that is the actual beginning of this whole revolution? That's the first outcry. That's the first statement. If if I I back it up, people say, what do you think of so-and-so and and what do you think of so-and-so and and this group and that group? And, And trying to not be egotistical about it, uh, by their supposed uh, uh, prolific statements, uh, I say they haven't said anything we didn't say. Not right. not just us, uh, Dylan, uh, everybody at that, that one point when, when we sort of liberated music seven years ago, there was a big surge of, of, of new music. And, and like Cher said, it wasn't against anything. It was just... Let us let us open up a little. Let mm-hmm. us expand. You know, mm-hmm. I I wrote a song called "Laugh at Me," because I was literally threatened. If you don't like the clothes I'm wearing, that's the price right. I'll pay. If you right, I was literally threatened oh. t- to be 
beat up by a, a seven foot giant because I had the audacity to walk in a restaurant, say dressed like this and my hair was shorter than this. Now this man just, just had, had to impress somebody. So I was saying, well, I'm gonna be this. And now it got to be a matter of principle. I said, well, damn it, then I'm gonna wear these clothes and go ahead and, and try. And again, with the young kids, I think they've got a chip on their shoulder now because somebody, somebody clarified that. Uh, uh, now, if you wear clothes just as an irritant factor, the, uh, I think that's unhealthy. If you wear what you want to because that suits you and that is you, and and it it belongs to you fine but but because that door is open now uh but now if you use that just to flaunt you know your point is so marvelous because when the whole thing started i made the typical mistake i i got involved in everything that was new and but i didn't quite understand it mm -hmm. i ran out and bought all those clothes <laughs> and i wore them and it was the funniest thing i've ever done in my life because as i got to know good? better what it was really about i said that's not it didn't what belong I to wear, you and right, i threw right, them all away right. well, no. did you exactly. let your hair grow <laughs> <No, that's, laughs> we must say goodbye now but we'll be back tomorrow with some more lively conversation on cups show <laughs>